Hello, this video recounts my method for creating a children's book. This isn't the only way, and may not work for everyone in all situations, but listening to my process might be informative and help you out. This is part one of two, which covers the planning of the book block and cover. Part two will cover the construction of the print files. Edison is credited with saying something like, Success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. I tend to agree, and this video will cover the perspiration part, not the inspiration part. I'm not telling you what to write about. I'm not giving you ideas about your story or characters or even your style of art. This video assumes you've got that part taken care of yourself. So if that part is what you need help with, you'll need to look elsewhere. This video begins from the presumption that you have your text and art ideas already and want to know how to get from there to a finished book. The creation process could be crudely broken down like this. Idea, execution, product. The idea is your lookout. The product will be constructed by your printing company. I am also assuming that you're here as a creator who intends to self-publish. If you are working for a publishing house, you will have to coordinate with them on what parts of this execution process is your responsibility and what part is theirs. But moving forward with the presumption that you, gentle viewer, are going to self-publish. The entirety of the execution is up to you. You will do everything required up to the point of sending digital files to the printing company. Of course, you don't have to. You can hire people or coerce your friends to take on portions of the execution. Perhaps your children's book is a team effort, so the tasks will be broken up between people. This video may still be useful to you because all these steps will still have to happen before going to print, and someone has to take care of them. If you're still listening, let's get started. Breaking down what I call the execution process into smaller, crude steps, I get something like this. You make some text. You make some art. You combine them into print-ready files. You send those files to the printing company. Each of these steps has its own challenges and can feel overwhelming to someone who has never made a book before. Each creator brings different skills and abilities to the table. You might be familiar with some graphic design terminology, or you might not. You might have scanned art before, or not. You might have worked with digital art software before, or you might not. I will assume you know nothing and explain everything. If you do know some of this stuff, feel free to ignore or skip ahead when I get to things that you already know. Step one, text and art. So you've got your idea for your book. Maybe you've made notes about your idea or have written some text or done some art already, or maybe you feel that you have finalized your text and art completely. I'm not here to judge your ideas, but you need to. Ideas exist in beautiful fantasy lands like exotic flowers, but you're going to have to nail them down and get concrete about them. There are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself, and before you can progress much further, you'll need answers so you can plan your book. To prepare yourself, you might get some benefit from going to your local bookstore and browsing the children's book section. Hold different books in your hands. Consider the dimensions of the books and the number of pages they have. Observe how books for different age groups have more or less text on the page, which books have dialogue, and which ones only narration, which ones have no text at all. Look at the balance of art to text per page. These are all considerations that will be questions for you in planning your book. Before leaving the bookstore, you may wish to support them with a purchase. In the future, this bookstore might be carrying your book in the local author section, so you might consider developing a good relationship with them. So here are the nuts and bolts questions you need to consider for your book. 
The first two critical ones are trim and count. What will be the trim size? Trim size refers to the width and height of the book when it is closed. The origin of the phrase comes from the printing process. The pages of your book will be printed on paper larger than the final size. Then the pages will be stacked and cut by machine, trimmed, into book blocks, which is what the interior portion of the book is called, the part that isn't the cover. In choosing a trim size, consider ease of use for your target readers. This prompts the question, what age are you creating for? Do you intend a parent to read the book to the child, or will it be handled by the child itself? Smaller books are easier for small hands to manage, but children can also spread open books against a flat surface like the floor. Identifying the age of the reader for your particular book will also impact how literal your text will be. For example, are you telling a story? or teaching shapes and colors, how much text you have, the level of vocabulary you use, and if you want lots of dialogue or narration. In general, the younger the reader, the simpler and sparser the text. For young readers, you might want the text to exactly reflect the art. Older readers can follow the story, even when the art doesn't show every single moment and scene found in the text. Choosing a trim size will also have a strong effect on your art. Your art needs to fit the size you pick. Do you intend to fill the page with your art edge to edge? Or will you have many little bits of art scattered around the page? Or perhaps you're making a book that is more of a graphic novel or comic, and the art is in fixed frames that need to fit the page. There are exceptions, but if you make your art, say, 8 by 8 inches, and want to fill your 12 by 12 inch page, stretching your art to fit will degrade its quality. The exceptions are if your art is made of vectors in a program such as Adobe Illustrator, or if you scan your traditional medium art at higher than 300 dpi. I'll talk more about art and planning your art later, so don't worry if you don't understand what that means just yet. The point I want to make right now is about choosing trim size while considering your art. If you haven't made your art yet, you have the freedom to pick any trim size you want and make art to fit it. If you have made your art, your trim size needs to be selected to fit your art to avoid having to stretch it. Other trim size considerations is what sizes does your printing company offer? Every imaginable trim size is usually not available. I use Ingram Spark to print my books, but there are many different self-publishing printers around. Whatever one you've chosen, go to their website and look up available trim sizes. Those are the options you get to pick from. Once you've picked your trim size, your next question is page count. In the past, there used to be firm options, Books came with pages in multiples of 16 or 18 or something like that. Now you can pick any page count you want, but again, check with your printer to be sure. I think most printers allow any count, and they just add a few blank pages at the back if they need to adjust the count to fit some standard. If any count is okay with your printer, then you have the freedom to pick for yourself based on a number of considerations. Before even thinking about how long your actual story will be, you should take into account the pages that will come before and after your story. Most books have one or two title pages, a page for copyright information, and perhaps a dedication page before the story starts. Additionally, at the end of the book, you might want a page about the author. In my books, I have a title page first, then the copyright page, then the dedication page, a page that lists my other works, and a more formal title page before the story starts. That's five additional pages. At the end, I have a blank page, right after the page that says the end, a thank you page, and an about the author page. Together, these pages make my book eight pages longer 
than just the story. You'll want at least some of these pages for your book, so don't forget that they are included in your page count. My actual story is 31 pages long, but with those other 8 pages, the whole book is 39 pages, and that is my page count. Of course, planning out the story pages is the most exciting part. You could just start creating and not limit yourself to a certain number of pages. Then you'd be left with however many pages your book ended up being. I don't think there's anything wrong with this, but you again might consider the age group you're creating for. Younger children tend to have shorter attention spans. If you've written your text, how much do you want to spread it out? How much text per page? How long is your story and how quickly or slowly do you want to move through it? Also, don't forget that the more pages you have, the more art you have to do. How long does it take you to do one drawing or painting or whatever it is you do? An hour? Ten hours? Three days? A week? Multiply that by your number of pages. Consider how much work you're setting yourself up for. Making a children's book is rewarding and satisfying, but it can also be a lot of work, like running a marathon that lasts weeks, months, or even years. Once you have picked your trim size and page count, you can begin planning your book block. You'll also need a cover, of course, but compared to the book block, the cover requires less strategic planning, so I'll talk about it later. Prepare to make your art, or start organizing your existing art. What do you want on each page? You must also decide whether your story will begin on a left-hand page or a right-hand page. This is up to you. Look at some children's books and decide which you like better. If you're going to run your art across the gutter, this might also affect how you decide what goes on which page. If gutter is a new term for you, it is the crease in the middle of the book, the inside of the spine. Sometimes art can run across it, from the left page to the right one. The coordination of your text and art will determine when you can or want to do this, and deciding whether your story starts on the left or right page for page one can affect how the rest of the story is sorted out, potentially eliminating the times you wanted art to cross the gutter. If you know in advance that there are pages you want linked with art across the gutter, work backwards from those pages until you see where your page one lands. Or you can just decide what side your first page will be on and adjust the rest of the book as you go. Additionally, you'll want to consider what parts of the story are facing each other as opposite pages when the book is open. You can affect the drama and action of your story by, for example, having the villain revealed by a turn of the page, rather than having him appear on the right side page, which could distract from whatever is happening on the left side. In general, I try to put big reveals and dramatic moments on left side pages, because that's where the eye goes anyway when a new page is turned, and it makes turning the page more exciting, I think. You can think about all these things as you start planning out your book block. I always start my page one on the left, but the choice is yours. My technique for picking what goes on what page is to start with my text and break it up in a Word document by page. If your text isn't finalized, that's okay, but you should probably at least have a draft that is pretty firm on order of events. If your book actually won't have text or have very little, make some notes about what will go on each page. Or you might want to do simple sketches for each page, if working with words isn't your natural instinct. After I break my text up by page, I often add notes of what the art for that page will look like. Again, you might choose to make a quick sketch instead. I print that document of text broken up by page and cut the text blocks apart. Then I prepare my art surface. I work on Bristol board in pen and ink, scan that, and add color in Photoshop. How you prepare to make the art is up to you, 
but here are some things to think about. You might want to create your art slightly larger than the trim size of the book. For example, my trim size for my series of otter books is 9 by 9 inches. I make my art 9.5 by 9.5 inches. There are two reasons. For one, book blocks have bleed if you want to run your art to the edge of the page. What is bleed? As I mentioned earlier, when the interior pages are printed, they are printed on paper larger than the trim size. Then they are stacked and cut, trimmed to the final size. Your printer will provide you with a template for setting up your book block file, and it will include bleed. Bleed is an extra eighth or a quarter of an inch that your art will extend beyond the trim size. When book blocks are trimmed, it is not always exactly perfect. The bleed allows for this inaccuracy. So even if the trim is a bit off, the art will still go all the way to the edge of the page and not leave an embarrassing white strip. Allow for that bleed when you make your art by making your art a bit bigger than your trim size. Reason two to go a bit larger is that you might choose to reduce the size of your art when placing it digitally. This is up to you, but I find that shrinking it just a bit helps tighten it up and eliminate any tiny flaws. In conclusion, I suggest making your art about a half an inch larger on all sides than the final print size, especially if you're running the art off the edge of the page. For my process, on my Bristol board, I use a ruler and draw out my spreads. Spreads are facing pages, touching at the gutter, as opposed to one-up pages where you see single pages one at a time. I suggest preparing your art in spreads so you can see the whole composition of the two pages together, as the reader will see them. Additionally, if you do have pages where the art crosses the gutter, Doing your art in spreads is pretty essential. Use a pencil to draw out your rectangular pages to whatever dimensions you're creating in. For my work, my trim size is 9 by 9 inches. I make my pages 9.5 by 9.5 inches, so a spread is 9.5 inches tall by 19 inches wide. You may be thinking ahead and wondering about how the printer puts your book together and how the bleed works in the gutter area and so on. Don't worry about that right now. Mostly, you don't need to know how the printer does it. That's their job, and you've got enough to be thinking about. When we get to how to assemble your art and text into print-ready files, I'll show you what you need to know. Once I've drawn out my spreads, I attach the text I printed beside the pages. I'll be reading it and referencing it while I'm drawing. This is just my method. You might need to modify it for your uses. If you already have your art done, of course you won't need to be drawing out your spread now and getting ready to do the art. If you haven't got any art yet, you might be wondering how best to make it. You don't have to do what I do, pen and ink followed by Photoshop. You should develop your own style and use the mediums you like best. One thing to think about, however, is how well your chosen medium and style will scan if you're doing traditional art. You will have to take your physical art and make it digital, and that means scanning it or getting high-quality photographs taken of it. Computers, scanners, and printers, by and large, are not yet as good as the human eye. What looks great in traditional media might not scan, get interpreted by a computer, and print as well as it looks in the original form. Subtle gradations, such as in pencil drawings, might be lost. In general, higher contrast art will make the journey better. Technology is always getting better and has gotten pretty dang good, but understand that no matter what your traditional medium is, it won't look quite as good or exactly the same once it has made the journey to the printed page. Even digital media can suffer, even though the journey is shorter. Printers cannot print everything the human eye can see. Sometimes very dark colors that you can see differences in on a backlit computer screen will just print as black on paper. 
If your screen isn't perfectly calibrated, the final print may appear more red, blue, or some other color than what you have created. There is the additional consideration of RGB and CMYK. I'm not going to give an in-depth explanation. If you want that, I'm sure you can go look it up and someone's made a great video. But I'll just summarize it in this way. RGB stands for red, green, and blue. Screens, like for your computer or TV, display all colors using a combination of these three colors. Screens have a very wide gamut, or range, of colors they can display. CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. These are the standard inks used when printing on paper, and their gamut, or range, is smaller than RGB. That means you might see something on your screen that can't be seen when that image is printed. To avoid this disappointment, work on digital files in CMYK. Now, some printers might tell you they accept RGB files. Some might even ask for your files in RGB. Comply at your own risk. I always work on my digital files destined for print in CMYK, just to be safe. If a printer wants files in RGB, I convert my files at the very end, right before sending them off. That way, I can be sure nothing is lost. Whatever your medium, if you need to make your art, set up your pages. I suggest setting them up in spreads and make with the arting. Okay, so you're working on art for the book block for the actual pages inside, but what about the cover? Every book needs a cover. Go to your printer, to their website, and seek a template. Most printers that work with self-publishers will generate for you a cover template based on your trim size and page count. You will probably also need to decide now if your book will be hard or soft covered. You might also have the option for a dust jacket. The choice is up to you after you learn what options your printer offers. The printer's website will allow you to download a template. It might give you a choice of formats such as Photoshop, InDesign, PDF, or others. Here is where your computer abilities might begin to hamper you. That is, if you don't have digital editing software and or don't know how to use it. I'm not making this video a tutorial on using such software. This video is about the process for putting together a children's book. If you don't know how to work with the file types offered by your printer or do not have the software, you have the choices of putting out money to get the software and taking the time to learn it or getting someone else to do it. Either way, you or the someone else will download your cover template, open it, and check out the dimensions in order to know what your limitations are for your cover art. Rule out the dimensions on your art surface of choice and make with the arting. As usual, you might want to work slightly larger than the template says. In my case, my cover front and back together is about 9 by 18 inches, but I make it a little bit larger so that I have the bleed, and so I can shrink it down just slightly. You will also need to consider title placement on the front, which will be the right side of the template, as well as any other text you want, such as credit to the author and artist. On the back, which will be the left side of the template, you might or might not put art, but at the minimum, you'll need an ISBN code. Some printing pr services, such as IngramSpark that I use, will sell you an ISBN code. You can also go on your own to Bowker's and buy your ISBNs directly. The latter is what I do. In setting up a book with a printer, you will probably sign a contract especially if you want the printer to distribute your books for you to retail outlets. Read this contract carefully, as it will specify what rights you are giving up to your work and what ones you retain. I do not suggest you work with a printer whose contract includes you giving up rights to your work. 
other than for marketing purposes, like them putting an image of your cover in their catalog that they send out. But I am not a lawyer, and if you have any doubts, you should run the contract past a real lawyer. The contract might also specify if, by buying an ISBN that the printer provides, the printer will be listed as the publisher of your book. You might wish to consider this. By buying your own ISBNs, you will always be listed as the publisher. You might also wish to put a blurb of text on the back of your cover. If you have a dust jacket, you will have to address the area of the flaps. On those, you might include information about the author or illustrator, a more extensive description of the book, or more art. If your children's book is particularly thick, you might have the option of a spine. But in most cases that I have seen, at least with my books, the spine option is not encouraged on a thin little children's book. These design decisions are up to you. You might want to make some sketches of how you want the finished cover to look as a guide and to identify artistic elements that need creating. Make the art now and the entire contents of the cover will be assembled in part two of this video. Part two will also include assembling the art and text and other elements of the book block.